Saskatchewan has been the breadbasket of Canada ever since it was settled. Now, Saskatchewan is number one in developing new crops, new ways of farming and marketing worldwide. On this episode of Max TV Magazine, we celebrate agriculture. Smell that beautiful, fresh Saskatchewan farm air. Welcome to another edition of Max Magazine. I'm your host, Brad Grass. And today we're at the beautiful Bovey Farm in Indian Head, Saskatchewan. Now, it is glorious out here. I could tell you all about it, but I'd better show you what this farm is all about with the help of Jeff and Sabrina Bovey. Thanks a lot for having us. Thank you. Thank you. And a nice new you. third addition to the family. Who's Wyatt. this? Wyatt. <laughs> Wyatt. And how old is Wyatt? He's five months old. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So the Bovey Farm here in Indian Head has been getting a lot of media attention very recently. But for those viewers out there who maybe aren't aware, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the Bovey Farm is all about, what makes it special. Oh, and, and your new website too. Sure. We started our farm two years ago uh, and we just, in the last six months, we've been working hard to produce our website called thegrazinggoose.com. So everything is seasonal and everything's raised outdoors on grass pastures, as you'll see. Um, and in doing that in the mind, most mindful way possible so we don't use any antibiotics or any hormones. It's no argument here. Farming has always been a major building block of this beautiful province. The agriculture industry is constantly developing new and better products and ways of farming and uh, more efficient. Scientists work together annually to produce better ways and, and products for farming. And that is what our first story is all about. A Saskatchewan invention and a farmer who grows it. Uh, I'm Doyle Weeb. I, uh, this is a farm that I've uh, become very familiar with as I uh, have spent more time at this place than anywhere else in the world. I grew up on this farm. Uh, the house over here is the one I grew up in and uh, it's now a, a, just a grain farm. When I was young it was a typical mixed farm with a, a small land base and cattle and pigs and chickens and all that. And uh, uh, Now it's an operation of uh, about 5,000 acres that is teaming up with a, a neighbor that's uh, coming into farming and we uh, are seeing another generation that still wants to farm. Uh, canola has come on the scene uh, most particularly in the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, earlier, into the, before the 70s, it was called rapeseed. Uh, it was a bit more minor specialty crop uh, for its oil primarily. Uh, it's a vegetable oil and uh, lubricant it was even used. But uh, they also found that there were some uh, things about the, the meal and about the oil, that some attributes that uh, weren't quite as, quite as healthy to both uh, human consumption and for animal consumption uh, in the meal, uh, which is used for as a protein supplement. In the uh, early 70s, uh, developed a, a new plant and uh, was so distinctly different in its production that they didn't want it confused with the, the older rapeseed, so they named it canola, which is uh, Canada's oil. Uh, they still call it rapeseed in, in Europe, but it's really uh, the same attributes as canola in Canada. Yeah, this year's season has had a little bit of everything, uh, not all good for sure, uh, where uh, the first issue was. Uh, a frost that happened just after the crop was out of the ground and that affected different fields differently, uh, really made it difficult to decide whether to reseed or not and, and we almost reseeded and, but uh, it was very dry by that time as well so reseeding might have been an issue but then some places got enough rain to, to start. Then it was so dry that just kind of the crop kind of gave up for a while but then even a little later we had a little hailstorm just before during when the rains were finally coming in late July, so we've had uh, there was and there had been some insect issues also when the crop was coming out of the ground uh, because of the uh, because of the frost kind of made it worse and uh, so uh, kind of a hit with a whole mixed bag of things this year and and I guess thankful that uh, we're getting what we're getting. Oh, we got a nice sample. If they were all like this this year, yeah, we'd be doing fine. But we've come to understand from the science community 
And from our own experience that the different uh, leaf diseases, fungal diseases and insects and so on uh, only like one species at a time. So uh, like canola has a certain insects that, that are attracted to canola, but they aren't attracted to wheat and barley and so uh, also with leaf diseases. So by rotating them uh, from year to year, uh, three to four years of a break, it really helps reduce the need to, to control those, uh, that it's a more of a natural control and it gives, you, gives us better yields for less cost and so we, we, we try to uh, uh, vary what we're growing. We aren't just monocropping as some people uh, think we are. Uh, we now grow uh, wheat and canola and uh, some faba beans and barley are in my rotation so that I have uh, at least three crops to four crops uh, to uh, rotate, make it more efficient and, and a lot more healthy uh, uh, rotation for disease control and insect control and different things like that that uh, are uh, uh, things that we uh, can control then uh, culturally instead of uh, only with, uh, with herbicides and pesticides in different ways. And, could have been worse. The, the rains did add, I think, some volume, but we won't just won't know what's here until uh, until we get the combine into it. Uh, uh, right now, I'm thinking it's uh, maybe 60 percent or so of, a, of what we were planning and budgeting for uh, in the spring, and we put this crop in the ground with all good intentions and, and uh, did everything we thought we needed to do to to uh, grow a good crop, but uh, just isn't there this year. I've gone uh, some years where every time I drive past the field, I just marvel at it, and it was so nice to, then to get it into the bin and, and just say that was uh, that was a job well done, and uh, and thank uh, thank the uh, uh, the weather gods for uh, providing the their part of it. Jeff has brought me to the free range here, uh, where we're feeding, uh, let's see, we've got turkeys, and we've got geese, and we've got chickens. There's all kinds of animals uh, milling about. And if you're looking for a fresh bird for the holidays, look no further, eh? Mm -hmm. and, and you do it all right here. We do it all right here, yeah. We raise them here on the pasture, on the grass. Everything that we raise is raised outdoors. We're seasonal, and we're going to be uh, taking care of the packaging and everything. Uh, the customers can come directly to us to pick up right at the farm and uh, that gives them an opportunity to come out and see what we're all about and to chat with us and learn about what we're doing here. And I'm saying the right thing, right? This is a uh, free range. This is free range, yeah. And But you know what? The term that we prefer to use is pasture raised or pasture based and, and we're proud of that. We're, we're, we're raising our animals all outdoors on pasture all season and it's really something that we're, we're excited about. Right now. In the agricultural industry, there's all kinds of animals that are raised for their meat or other products like uh, eggs or milk or or honey. And with new uh, developments in farming, uh, getting better and better all the time, uh, new products uh, that are happening, it's no surprise that partnerships are, are being formed. And from those partnerships, we get some very, very sweet rewards. Hey, Jordan, good to see you. Doyle, good to see hey. you. OK, yeah. So you got some bees down the road here, eh? I do. Yeah. I've got some. Uh... But we're in 3074, so about a mile and a half straight that way. Oh, yeah. It's probably about yeah. 40 or 60 hives, and I got someone near land. Yeah. Another mile up. up so this, so this, uh, this canola field got had uh, probably some samplings from them uh, as well? Oh, yeah. 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 They, they like canola better than the, bean, the beans over there? <laughs> uh, canola is one of their, one yeah. of their favorite, favorite forage areas. Yeah, yeah. My dad started in our backyard with about two beehives. Um, I clearly remember them under the crab apple tree in the backyard. That was about 1975. I honestly don't remember, say, life before bees. They've just always been around for me. We've grown into what we consider to be an overgrown hobby. 
Uh, right now we've grown to about a thousand beehives. It keeps us busy. This, this is where a lot of our self-sustainability comes from. One of the keys to success is being self-sufficient. You know, if you look around the beekeeping community, a lot of the more successful ones make their own queens. Uh, in terms of genetics, uh, when you raise your own queens, you're able to pick you know, your strongest hives, make it through winter well, you know which ones are producing honey, you know which ones have hygienic behaviors, which is uh, one of the keys to fighting the varroa mite. We're not really looking for bees that are so-called resistant to varroa mite, we're looking for ones that are tolerant. Say if there's a varroa mite underneath that capping in the, in, in the larva, you know, they'll get in there, kill it, clean it out. This is one of my breeder colonies. What we have here is the brood chambers down here. There's a special cage in the middle here where the queen is, is caged up, and she's on a frame there. That way I can time how old the eggs are, get to the larva when they're at the appropriate grafting age. I graft the larva onto the cell cups, and then put them back in here. And then the, with a little luck, the uh, hive turns it into queen cells. So this graft was done about four days ago. You can see there's a lot of nice royal jelly in there. So the, the bees are feeding them quite well. So I will make some more nukes, harvest these cells and pop them in. or baby hives, or nukes as we call them. They're set up with brood, which is the baby bees in various stages from egg to capped. Uh, these here are queen cells. So I'll pop one of these in into the nuke. These are ready to emerge in a day or so. This area here, these are all workers. When they first come out, they clean the hive a little bit, turn into nurse bees, uh, then it goes foragers, then guards. Uh, the drones are the male bees. One purpose, and that's mating with a queen. Drones don't have stingers. Yeah, that one's getting me there. Usually when a bee returns from foraging or uh, scouting, uh, when it's found a good nectar source, it'll come back to the hive and it shakes its body in various directions. And that tells the, the other foragers where to go. It'll you know, tell it to go due east, two miles, turn right at the whatever corner and you'll find your canola field or your alfalfa or clover. It's been a busy queen. <laughs> Beautiful honey in there. So you can see here, they're starting to cap it over. So for the bees, this honey is at the right moisture level. So it's also telling us that it's pretty much ready to take off. my brother Brendan. Uh, he more or less looks after the extracting part of the, the operation. Helps with, you know, the, the paperwork end, CFIA regulations, making sure everything's documented, and helps recruit a lot of the labor we have around here. We try to uh, staff from within the community, uh, which involves, you know, high school kids. We usually start them off around grade 10. Some of them have stayed with us through two, three years at university, so they're with us for four or five years. These vats hold 10,000 pounds. Most of what you see there was extracted yesterday. Uh, during our peak season, we usually fill about one tank a day. You know, it's, it's a short season, but fairly intense. We're members of uh, the Alberta Honey Co-op, so we ship it off to Bee Made Honey. So it'll show up in your local grocery stores as Bee Made. Every beekeeper in Saskatchewan that I know of has had a significant loss in the past 10 years. Whether that's beekeeper mistake, uh, varroa mite, you know, disease, you know, it's multifactorial. This year, the bees overwintered very well. Approximate losses are 10 to 15 percent, which is way better than the 20 to 30 percent of the previous years. I think there's an estimated 105 to 110,000 colonies producing in Saskatchewan this year. This is my father, Len. He's the one that founded this place uh, back in, I guess, 1975 with the two beehives and uh, has kind of kept me employed ever since. We're standing in Sabrina's garden. 
What I like is, is you carry through that whole organic, healthy experience in your own garden. That's right, yeah, no chemicals whatsoever. No. Everything here is grown with love. The message we really want to get across here is get to know your local farmer. That's right, yeah, that relationship's so key and we want people to connect to that person. And um, if someone's coming out here to buy some of our products, then they get like dibs on rating our garden. Oh, nice, <laughs> nice, and what a beautiful, as you can see, gorgeous garden. Would it be possible to maybe grab something? Yeah, of course. Something? Um, what would you like? You, you, you Pumpkins, pick. Beef, it's your garden. You grab, pick. Like, I think oh, nice. awesome. Hey, here's my one heirloom beet that I'm saving. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that is huge. You can pull. Can I? Wait, is there one? There's actually a second one in there, but yeah, there's Do one you, massive one. Can I actually pull this out? Yeah. Are you go sure? ahead. All right. <laughs> oh, oh my! Look! Oh! oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Shield, look at that! <laughs> it is too, look at that! See? This is what happens when you grow with love and you do it organically and, 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 and healthy, right? Yeah, with lots of amazing compost. I have to say, oh. this isn't just all my doing, it's a lot of Jeff adding a whole bunch of really natural compost to the garden. He yeah. added, he said, about 100 bags worth this spring. Oh so my that's, goodness. That's why we've got amazing vegetables, a lot of great compost. And, and, and this this is what it's all about. This is, is good eating you know and, and and really it's it's what saskatchewan is all about even as we speak i mean there are farmers and growers working together to find uh, ways to grow produce like this very very efficiently and uh, ultimately i mean it's not just the responsibility to feed saskatchewan but what they're working towards ultimately is to find effective ways to feed the world So pulse by the traditional name means legume crops that are consumed as whole seeds by either humans or livestock. So for example, peas, the whole seed is used and consumed by many people throughout the world, right? The pulse crops that we grow here in Saskatchewan include peas and lentils are our main ones. Then we have chickpeas, faba beans, dry beans, and we also have soya beans. Now soya beans is kind of a quasi pulse because there are food grade soya beans that are, that are consumed as whole for humans, but the main focus for soya beans is really for the oil crush. Well Saskatchewan is very important to uh, both the Canadian pulse industry and the global pulse industry. Saskatchewan produces over 95% of Canada's lentils and chickpeas and 65% of Canada's peas. These are all varieties developed in Saskatchewan. These are all varieties from the Crop Development Centre that are here. Saskatchewan is the breeding ground for pulses in Canada and really probably, you know, uh, North American wide, especially for the peas and the lentils. The varieties that growers are now growing uh, perform better agronomically, they have better yield, they have better disease resistance, and I think that speaks to uh, the partnership that growers have had with the University of Saskatchewan Crop Development Centre over the years that has been a major reason for the increase in yields and, and productivity and really helping to place Canada on the global stage for pulse production and exports. We do uh, plant breeding for uh, uh, peas, lentils, beans, chickpeas and faba beans. We also work on uh, soybean. These are some of our uh, pea yield trials. Um, we're looking for uh, uh, the higher yielding varieties as part of uh, uh, variety development for uh, new varieties for Saskatchewan farmers. There's been many advances in the pulse industry in terms of variety development to herbicide tolerance, to disease tolerance, to just you know marketing characteristics. There's lots of advancements that we've benefited from from the Crop Development Centre at the University. This is an isolation tent. We've got uh, some faba beans growing in underneath of the tent. The netting is to uh, keep the insects out because uh, we want to limit the uh, pollinations that they cause. Some of the lentils in some of the bags here are um, wild species lentils. Each one is a different accession um, harvested from uh, different parts of the world. So each one has to be kept separate. Like the uh, wild species and germplasm that we get from around the world. 
have been collected by you know different organizations and preserved in gene banks that we can order seed from. We can use it in variety development and uh, research here at the university. And we can use uh, the wild species to look for traits that uh, will benefit the farmers in Saskatchewan because we can look for things like uh, better disease resistance, better drought tolerance and stress tolerance, cold tolerance, and um, higher yield. In the hands of seed growers, they go from breeder seed, which is a sample that comes straight from the, the breeders themselves, so it's a pure line, and then they go through a few generations until they get certified seed, which then is sold to the producers, the general population of producers that are then planted for commercial production. The, the demand for pulse crops from uh, the food ingredient side of things from food companies is very large. So we've seen companies reformulate pasta products with lentil flour, with chickpea flour. We've seen a major breakfast cereal manufacturer include lentils in a breakfast cereal product. So I think we're just on the tip of the iceberg with respect to increasing pulse utilization. Food companies are interested in, in the benefits for the nutrition label on the back of the package, higher protein, higher fiber high mi micronutrient levels, all of which help uh, uh, really provide increased nutrition for consumers. Well, I think the future of farming and markets is tremendously exciting for Saskatchewan agriculture. We're expecting to see a population on the planet of uh, 9 billion people by 2050, and we think pulses and plant-based protein can play a tremendous uh, role in providing food security to a, a hungry, growing world. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Now, what's nice about all of this, now here's where uh, Jeff and Sabrina really bring this full circle because we've covered today uh, how you grow uh, organically in a very healthy approach to your farm and your produce. But now you also help us in how to think about the, the healthy ways in which we eat. That's right, so I'm offering a retreat on the farm and at the retreat women can come and learn about the psychology of eating and um, really participate in some great strategies to um, put their cravings on hold and do some really awesome things when it comes to refocusing on their eating and uh, making better choices. Because that's the key, right? Because we talked about uh, the, all the information that we're bombarded with all the time but no one ever really talks about how to think about those cravings that you have or how to think about what it is that you're putting into your mouth. Yeah, no, it's huge, right? Yeah. You can really change everything by changing your thinking around food and, and making the better choices and that that um, includes the portions that people are, are mm -hmm. making, the quality of the food that they're um, consuming and how they're um, able to change their whole eating environment, basically. And this right here is one of the many reasons why Saskatchewan has always been considered the pride and joy of the farming community in the country. I mean, it's it farms like the Bovee Farm leave a lasting impression in the mind that lasts forever. And farming improvements like right here at the Bovee Farm make me proud to say that Saskatchewan is my home. So thank you once again for allowing us to, to be here, your beautiful farm and your gorgeous family. Okay, and thank you for joining us in yet another edition of Max Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, they found something to worship. If you have program ideas that you'd like to see on Max TV Local On Demand, write us at max.local at sastel.com. Max TV programming is now available on Max TV On The Go at maxtvonthego.sastel.com.